Health care was on the agenda today during phone calls between Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the Quebec and Manitoba Premiers. Facing a crisis in their hospitals, all provincial and territorial leaders are demanding a sit-down with Trudeau in the new year to hash out a funding agreement. Both sides agree more money is needed, but the federal government wants strings attached. We are ready to further increase health care investments through the Canada Health Transfer. In addition, we are ready to invest more in funding through tailor-made agreements with provinces and territories that will allow us to provide better care to Canadians. We owe it to Canadians to come together and find immediate and longer-term solutions to address those challenges. So how much longer can Canadians afford to wait for a health care solution? We're going to ask Dr. Jane Philpott, who as health minister helped broker home care and mental health deals with provinces in 2016 and 2017. Jane Philpott is now the dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at Queen's University. Jane Philpott, I'd like to start, if I could, with the, the situation between the federal government and the provinces over health care funding, something you've got very specific experience with when you were the Minister of Health. I mean, is it just a big bulk transfer of cash? Is, is that what the health system needs right now? No, I think this, the health system does need more cash, for sure, but it needs to be done in a smart way. We, uh, as I've said to you over the years, uh, we spend a lot of money per person on health care, but we don't get the best outcomes in the world for that money. We need to invest in, a mu in much smarter ways, and so I think that the feds and the province need to come together and say, Yes, let's grow the transfer, but let's do it in a way that's actually going to get delivery for people who are desperately in need of better health systems. I remember the last time we had a, a big standoff like this. You were health minister. I think Bill Morneau was finance minister. And you, you found your Brian Gallant and got New Brunswick to break ranks. And then you picked them off province by province. I mean, how, how would you advise uh, Jean-Yves Duclos uh, to, to approach things in the current dynamic? Yeah, I would say that the issue of whether or not all provinces and territories decide at the same moment and sign on mass versus whether it's done piece by piece is probably the less critical issue than the conversation around what is this new money going to buy uh, for the country? And, you know, the country is in a lot worse shape from a health systems point of view than it was at the time that I was a uh, health minister in, in that we've gone through this very challenging pandemic time of the last three years. And the backlogs are enormous. People are exhausted. The health workforce is is, uh, is is more than decimated. And so it's really important that this money goes to actually see change, that people will finally get access to family doctors and primary care in this country. And that's the kind of thing that the federal government should be buying with their increased investments in, in the provinces and territories. But how do, you, how do you buy that if the premiers aren't willing to sell, right? Because they're saying they want uh, this increase and they want no conditions and and right now you can't even get an agreement on who should meet when to talk about what so how do you move past where we are at this moment great question and always easier said than done but the kinds of things that the federal government is talking about are are among the smart things you know we need to agree that we're going to share health data in a much better way we need to agree on a national health workforce strategy so those things should be fairly easy wins but we also know that there are other mechanisms that we have, including the way that we've run the Canada Health Act to say, look, you get this money. If you don't deliver access to care, then we're going to claw it back. So why not use that kind of mechanism for other kinds of care, like access to family doctors and primary care to say, look, we'll give you X billion dollars more. But if we find that you cannot by, you know, two years from now, three years from now, guarantee a family doctor or a primary care provider for everyone in your province, then we're, we're going to ask for the money back. So, you know, it's time to have those kinds of difficult conversations. And money, though, as you know, is only one part of it. It's the supply of family doctors, supply of nurses, supply of specialists. And I know in your role as the dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at Queen's University, that's the training ground for a lot of these people. I mean, how does the post-secondary institutions, the health authorities, how, what, where do they fit into this in, in terms of innovating or expanding what they offer to fill some of these skill gaps? 
Well, I'm very glad that you asked that because as you said, I am now in the university space and our our core business is training health professionals. We have here at Queens, a school of medicine, a school of nursing, a school of rehabilitation therapy. So we train the health workforce of the future. We are innovating in really interesting ways that are being well taken up. So for example, we're growing our medical school here. The province gave us new seats for our medical school, but rather than doing business as usual, we're putting those new seats, 20 percent increase in our class size into selecting medical students who are committed to family medicine, who will go through a seamless program from their MD degree right through to a family medicine residency and be ready to work out in communities because that's the way they're trained from the start. So there's a lot of really interesting innovation like that happening. Uh, and we've had, as I say, uh, tremendous support. The province is, is uh, really keen about this. And we actually think it's going to be one of the, the good solutions out there for addressing the big challenges we're facing. Okay, so just make sure I, I, I got that correct. You got a 20% increase in, 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 in medical school seats, but those are reserved for people who are definitely going to do family medicine, and then you shoot them right into a, pre, uh, a residency program when they're ready to go. They don't have to shop around. I mean, how, how mechanically does that work? If I got into your med school today in this program, how, how would it work for me? So this is truly um, uh, being designed as we speak. Okay. So, uh, you know, you're getting the, the cutting edge news here. Uh, we will still have our main core MD program here on Queen's campus, as we've always done a fantastic medical school campus here. We're partnering with a part of the province uh, in the Durham region of Ontario with a, a, an organization called Lake Ridge Health uh, as the site for our new campus. And that campus will be devoted to students who specifically say, I want to be a family doctor, not just I want to be a doctor, but I want to be a family doctor. And they will be put through this program and be able to go right through medical school get their family medicine training. They will be heavily embedded in the community from the start and building those relationships with those communities and ready to, uh, to provide comprehensive family medicine care when they graduate. Okay, and, and for the record, I'm not sure I could get into Queens, definitely not the medical school. But just, just one final point, you know, the provinces say they need money, but you know, you, with your understanding of, of the systems, I mean, are there things that the provinces could be doing right now to, to improve things that don't require extra cash from the federal government? Well, in fact, yes. And, uh, you know, I think it's a matter of where we're spending the money. I'm going to always have my family medicine bias hat on in, in that, you know, this access, lack of access to family doctors and primary care is a huge problem, right? Because ultimately, if someone's sick, they're going to need to get care. And if we have now somewhere close to 5 million people in this country that don't have a family doctor, if they're sick, where are they going to go? They're going to end up going to an emergency department. Not the best place to get longitudinal primary care. They provide a great service, but it's meant for emergencies. It's a lot more expensive than delivering primary care, and it, people don't have a place to come back for follow-up. So trying to divert some of the money that we're spending at the most expensive parts of the health system and moving it into areas that are less expensive, but uh, sometimes more effective, like primary care or home care, mental health care, all of those things that don't actually cost an enormous amount of money, but actually will save us money down the road. So shifting systems, making sure we shift the tasks so that the sometimes the lesser expensive healthcare professional is providing care. So better use of nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, nurses, um, and not always necessarily needing physicians who are uh, a more expensive health professional. Uh, those are all the kinds of things that everyone knows needs to be done. And we need uh, provinces and health systems, health authorities priorities to shift in that direction as quickly as possible. Okay, Jane Philpott, always good to talk to you. It's been a while. Thanks so much for joining us today. Nice to be with you.